so great to be with you guys. Man, just getting near this hotel, you could just feel the vibe all the way down to Cuba. It was just <laughs> this presence here. It's so beautiful. So um, honored to be here today, and I'm just thankful I'm here. I had, yesterday was the unbelievable flight situation where literally I was, my flight uh, was being canceled every two hours, every two hours. Then when I got to 8.30, I realized when they sent me the text that you're on the 9.30 flight tomorrow. So I, I called the Admiral Club desk, and I, I, the American Airline desk rather, and, and I said, I need your help, and blah, blah, blah. And they went through Delta, they went through United, they went through everything. And then all of a sudden, a call comes in to me at this moment where I was about to tap out. And it was none other than Rice Brooks. I said, hold on, can you hold on a second? I'm gonna bring in somebody that may have an answer. <laughs> Within 10 minutes, he had booked me on Southwest Airline last night, <laughs> through Baltimore, through Nashville. He picks me up at the airport. It's midnight, we go to bed, we get up at three o'clock, and he takes me to the airport. Now that is a true friend right there, <laughs> truly. So I'm happy to be here. And I want to go right to the God's Not Dead video right now because this is a little glimpse of what Dr. Rice Brooks is doing all over this nation going campus to campus. Let's go to the video. to expect coming into this. I honestly didn't know a lot about God's Not Dead, but I absolutely loved everything I heard. Um, any sort of doubts that I ever had, they were all destroyed today. Uh, and any type of like common doubts that I've heard of, um, the God's Not Dead guys had something to say for every one of them. Um, before, I was really excited to hear like what they were going to say in their presentation, and after, I'm really glad I came to hear what they had to say. It was very nice. So thankful for what Dr. Rice is doing around the country and how he is literally taking on the campuses. I was in a meeting with one of the top leaders of Campus Crusade, which we call Crew, and remarkably he said, the God's Not Dead presentation is the most fruitful thing that we have happening across the university campuses across this nation. And that's quite an endorsement. We're very thankful. You can go to their booth today to find out more of where they're going to be because right now they're on a roll. The God's Not Dead team is here, Addison and Joe and others. So thank you guys for all that you're doing. So um, I've spent my life serving students and I wanna just offer a few things that I'd like to bring up, some resources that are really exciting, to, at least to me and I think maybe to you too. First of all, there's a video podcast that's coming out very soon and uh, we're very grateful to Pastor Shaddy Solomon for opening the door. 
I thought that would happen. Pastor Shaddy has been sitting on the golden egg called Al Karma TV, which many of you, most of you, almost all of you have never heard of. Hundreds of millions of people are following Al Karma TV. It was born after 9-11, and we've been given this show to my wife Lynette and I to bring in students like you to share your testimony. How many of you would like to share a significant story and let millions of people hear from you what God has done in your life? And so we have that opportunity uh, for that. We also, the American Association of Christian Counseling has given a discount of $2,400 for their exceptional curriculum, all on mental wellness. And that's gonna be available to you for $50. Uh, which is absolutely amazing. And then I think uh, Pastor Phil is doing a seminar on that later today, uh, Phil Benassa that is. And then um, I wanted to mention also that my wife Lynette has a new program that's coming out that she's actually been doing for 20 years called My Why, helping people to find and discover their purpose and actually write it down. And it's a game changer for so many people. And that's also, and we have the QR code is gonna be up, the app, it's all in the app. And if you will simply give us some feedback, like maybe your email address or something like that, then we'll be in touch with you with all of these things. Um, I wanna now go into scripture and uh, let's read Matthew 28, 18 through through 20. Uh, This is the focus of the message this morning called One Call. Jesus came and he said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now let's go to the next, the sort of the, the next piece of this, Matthew 10 verse seven and eight, and Jesus said to them, I want you to heal the sick, go proclaim, uh, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. That is the commissioning that we're about today, to go and make disciples, to go and raise the dead to go and heal the sick. My story is one that's probably common to many of you. I was a secular person growing up in a secular Jewish family. At the age of 18, I had never been to any church service. I had never really heard the gospel ever. When I was 15, a lady up the street, she came and she knocked on the door and she said, I have a present to give to you. And I opened it up, and it was a green Bible called the Living Bible. And I had enough Southern training to the protocol as, yes, ma'am, thank you, ma'am. But when she left, I I just chuckled, like, what is this woman thinking? We don't do this in this house. And so, three years later, I was going off to college as a freshman, loading up the back of my aunt's car, And my mother came running out after I was finished packing. She said, there's a couple books that you left here. And one was the Bible that I had never opened. It was in my closet. And she said, I said, Mama, what am I going to do with that Bible? She said, well, you might need it for a literature class. So I immediately thought, cha-ching, I just saved $10. Sure, let me take that. See what kind of mythology is in this. Get to the dorm at Appalachian State University. Freshman year. My, my, my roommate did not, was not able to show up on time. And so all of a sudden I'm lo- unloading all the books and all the things that I have. I pull that green Bible off the shelf, open it up for the first time. And there was a $5 bill and a nice note that fell out of the book. I was shocked, a very kind note. So I looked through the other pages, maybe there's a 20, <laughs> maybe a 50. I was hopeful. And I said, well, I don't even know where to begin, but maybe I'll look at this and give it a chance. I went to the table of contents. Now, if you've never seen these Bibles, like Leviticus, it's like Leviticus, the book of Psalms, the book of Job. I mean, I literally did not know that illiterate. And yet I saw my brother's name and it's Mark. And that's where I said, okay, I'll start now since my roommate won't be here for another week or two. 
I would have been somewhat ashamed or embarrassed reading the Bible, having been raised in a secular Jewish family bent against anything that is Christian. And by about the seventh day of reading the Gospel of Mark, it was like Jesus of Nazareth walked into that dorm and I was born again. That was the beginning. Then you fast forward a year later, I, I transferred to UNC and then a year later, I'm stuck in a, yes, go heels. I'm stuck in a dorm room with a, a, a Lebanese charismatic Christian woman. And she is telling me about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And man, at that point, I'm like, this is weirding me out. So here I'm a new believer, but I'm listening to her. And then finally, after all the debating, she says, I'll tell you what, I'm just going to pray for you. I was too proud to say, no, don't pray for me. So I let her pray for me. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of God comes on me and I get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then a year after that, I'm a junior at UNC and a young evangelist comes ripping and storming through our campus and it's Rice Brooks. I hear a message and I realize after three years of walking with Jesus, I've never been water baptized. So I was water baptized that night by Rice. Go back to my dorm room. Somebody followed me into my dorm room. It was one of my classmates who said, I'll tag along with you tonight. He saw me get baptized and he was so touched by the whole thing that he jumped in full, fully dressed into the tub at the Carolina Inn Hotel. He gets baptized and then he gets filled with the Spirit. We're walking, you know, a couple miles back to our dorm and on the way there he says, something really special happened to you but nothing happened to me. I said, what do you mean nothing happened to you? That was incredible what happened to you, Robert. He said, well, he, said, he was dazed by what happened. It was like he sort of like went under for a little bit and he's walking back trying to pick up the pieces. And he said, let's get in the dorm and will you pray for me? I said, I'd be glad to. I prayed for him and the same thing happened on him again. And it begins to be filled with the spirit. And then here he is with a very culturally conservative Christian denomination. I won't mention the name, but it has something beginning with a B. But... The brethren, the brethren, the brethren. But this guy then all of a sudden gets so filled with the Spirit, he begins to speak in other tongues. And it was midnight, and, and he got so loud that I was like, oh no, can you please just keep this tongue between you and God? This is really embarrassing. You know, some things that God does in our lives are just flat out embarrassing. And you know what I want to say about that? Get used to it, guys. Just get used to it. And sure enough, I get a knock on the door and I peek open and it's, it's the RA. She's like, what is going on in here at midnight? And I said, language practices, language practices. <laughs> and I shut the door. <laughs> and there were many more things that happened to me. And all I can say is that God must love dorm rooms because he certainly has showed up in my dorm so many times that the reason I'm on this stage, I answered the call when I was reading the Bible and I was redirected away from graduate school to just go follow Jesus and be a preacher of the gospel. Now, as I was a, uh, began to start the, the ministry and part of the ministry at UNC Chapel Hill, I started meeting a lot of students over the years and it's been 40 years of serving students. It's been perhaps the bullseye of my, and the target of my ministry. It's been one of the greatest privileges to serve God on a campus and to raise up people. And at UNC, there were so many things, great things that were happening, so many great people. And I got to see with my own eyes, first uh, people who come to Christ and then they get baptized, they become discipled. And then next thing you know, they are drafted first round in the draft choice. They become attorneys, they become doctors. And there is a move of God. And one of those special people who I met was a guy named Casey and his, and his, his fiance Shija. And they are, uh, yeah, we have, that's my family up there. It's, we're not exactly, we don't exactly there. There's one of Casey and me where we are just getting to know each other. He doesn't know the Lord yet. He soon becomes a follower of Jesus. And then he and his fiance, they get married. He and Shija get married. And then they go to Taiwan, both with a professorship. They both are professors. 
She got her PhD, and next thing you know, they're planting a church in China, and then multiple churches in China, then two churches in Taiwan, then on a furlough, a sabbatical, they come back to the home church at Kings Park International Church, which all of that campus stuff ended up in becoming a church for the region. And remarkably, they have all these churches that they started. And then you go to a guy, Simon Suh. He was at NC State. He ended up, after he graduated here, he's married to an escapee from North Korea, a refugee. He, he rescued, he and his team rescued 300 North Koreans who were under very radically intense persecution. He's a hero. And... The first ever historic crusade in Mongolia was, was this crusade where Simon was in charge of pulling this crusade together. It ended up being two great churches in Mongolia for every nation. And he started churches in South Korea in, the, in that peninsula. And remarkable things happened through his life. Very proud of KC and very proud of Simon and very thankful for the international students whom we so love. People have asked me, how did all these international students come to your church? It's very simple. Jesus said, if you love me, you're going to feed my sheep. You just feed internationals food. You let them taste a burger. You let them taste some southern grits if you're from the south. You let them try something new. And all of a sudden, and the, 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 the technical evangelistic term for what we do, it's called gastroevangelism. It works every time. It is a college sensation. Three pizzas and some more bread on top of the pizzas, and you've got a meal. And people call it a miracle. Anyway, <clears throat> we are grateful. We believe in the word hospitality. The Greek word is xenophilia, which means friend of the foreigner, friend of the international. Not xenophobic, but xenophilia. We are a friend. And that's cool that that's hospitality is embedded in Scripture from the beginning of the Bible all the way to the end where we are at the marriage supper of the Lamb himself. Thank you, Jesus. So if we really want to hit the target of changing culture, we also have to just reach normal college students. American born and bred college students. We want to do our very best to see a revival and a move of God happen on the campuses of America so that we can push back the darkness and claim this land for Jesus Christ. Now, I don't mean that in an extreme way that, that everyone in every political office is, is going to be a follower of Jesus. Wouldn't that be great? But, it's, but I want to say that there is a place that God wants to move us into culture where we can begin to bring darkness down and let the light come. And it's really not that complicated. Jesus said, let your light shine before men and women so that they might see your light and give your Father in heaven all the glory, the Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, the glory. All it takes is letting your light shine. There's nothing hard about that. Let it shine. You don't make it shine. You don't force it to shine. You just let your light shine. You open doors for people. You provide. You give. You serve. You ask who they are. You get their information. That in the Jesus app, I, I love the Jesus app because at 800 uh, the Jesus Film app, 800 languages are in there. Every cab I get in, I am able to give away the most watched movie in history to my cab driver in New York City. And remarkably, they can hear it in their own language. And every time, and my little nine-year-old twin girls, are, are, they give me the motion in the back. Okay, it's time, Dad. That's all they have to say. It's time. It's time. Time what? Time to share the gospel with the person in front of me. And when you do it in their language, whether they're Muslim, Hindu, Sikh, Jewish, atheist, whatever, they always smile when they hear it in their language. We are on this planet to make a difference. We are on this planet to express glory to God. We are on this planet to share the gospel of Jesus with everyone that we possibly can. Um, as disciples, we have a passion for the world. And I want to say every nation reach every nation. Yes. Pretty simple, right? Some reminder, every nation campus. We remember that. Let's reach every nation. But let's be true to what we're called to be and to do in this nation. 
unlike many, I happen to have hope for this nation. Seems like sometimes it gets dark. Everybody gets, goes to the book of Revelation. So we just need that rapture. We just need that rapture. We just need that rapture. Look, I feel that way a lot of times. When my wife's mad at me, Lord, I need that rapture. I need that rapture. I need that rapture. When a church person who talks a lot and I'm exhausted and I want to go home and they just won't let, stop talking, I need a rapture, Jesus. I need a rapture. <laughs> but what if we're here for another thousand years? I think somebody wrote a book on that. Can we make a difference? Can we grow? Can we multiply? Can we have an impact? I want you to, I want you to be a part of making disciples in the most dynamic and amazing way. I want you to be a part of that. Why? Number one, because Jesus Christ is Lord. Two, because of the what? It's to make disciples for the rest of our lives. And three, how? Through student-led gospel movements. Student-led gospel movements. There are four couples who, when they were young, they went to Europe, four different, in, in, four different couples. They all went to Europe from our church, and they made a massive impact on the Ukraine. Little did we know that something that we did 30-some years ago would have such an impact right now. Ukraine, Scotland, Poland, France, Spain, and other places were just through those four. Why do I bring this up? Because I want this to be an imprint in your spirit that maybe one day that God may want to give you a nation. Yes. Why not? Ask of me, Psalm 2 says, ask of me and will I not give you the nations as your inheritance? Yes. It's your inheritance. All you got to do is ask. Yes. Ask of me. Ask of me. I'm looking around seeing a South African who came to America. It goes in re reverse sometimes. It goes the other way around. Some of the most dynamic people now in, in America preaching are from a different nation. Everything is changing. So what is a disciple? A disciple of Jesus is one who follows Jesus. They follow Jesus. It's being transformed by Jesus. And they are gung-ho about the mission of Jesus. That's what a disciple is. Gung-ho is simply a Chinese phrase meaning working together. And that's what we do. We work together to reach the world. Now what's it going to take to make great disciples? Let's go to a passage in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 17. And we're going to read 17 through 19. It's a very simple uh, story that perhaps you've already seen this, but there was a, what's called a Shunammite woman. You know why she's called a Shunammite? It's because she's from Shunem. <laughs> really tricky, right? <laughs> I always love, the Bible makes it easy. Canaanite. Mosquito bite, <laughs> Bud Light. <laughs> so there's a prophet named Elisha, moving on. Elisha received his mantle or his calling or anointing or impartation from his spiritual prophetic dad, Elijah. And this is Elisha. He's walking in the double portion. I feel like this is an important passage for us. Uh, let's look at verse 17. And this, to this Shunammite woman, I'm going to find the verse any second here. Uh, thank you. But the woman, this woman, this Shunammite woman was promised a child. She could not have children. And Elisha gave her the word that you're going to have a son. The woman conceived, she bore a son about the time following the spring, as Elijah had said to her. And when the child had grown, he went out one day to his father among the reapers, and he said to his father, oh, my head, my head. Father said to his servant, this typical dad, carry him to his mother. <laughs> now, it goes on to say that when the child went back to his mom, probably 10 or 11 or 12 years old. He had a stroke and he died, probably a stroke. Now, when I read this about a month or two ago and I was going, just doing my morning stuff and reading and connecting with God, I read this and I began to think about our culture. Began to think about the head 
in our world that is aching all over the place, all over. And I started thinking about mental health issues. I started thinking about habits that we have for self-inflicted thoughts. Did a little bit of research. Dr. Daniel Amen with the Amen Clinic said 80% of our thoughts are negative. He called them ants for automatic negative thoughts that can only be replaced by Pat's positive affirming thoughts. And through this, I began to go a little bit deeper into what's happening in the world today through negative thought and belief systems and struggles with identity issues, gender issues, emotional issues, drug issues, anxiety issues, substance abuse and addictions, social media addictions, which lately has been called digital fentanyl. Then you have moral injury, disconnection, trauma, and you have suicide issues. Four students took their lives at North Carolina State University recently, four. So it's right at our doorstep. My friend, Dr. Nee Addy, uh, has a lab at Yale. He's a professor at Yale, and we put a program together called God, Mental Health, and Wellness in New York City. When we opened the Eventbrite to this event in New York City in a large auditorium, 1,000 people registered in the first hour. So we have a pandemic now, post the pandemic, we have that pandemic of moving from the germs on the outside to what's on the inside. Now, why do I bring this up? I don't bring it up to sink anyone or to discourage anyone. I bring it up, number one, because we can all to some level agree that this is an issue and we ourselves are either in this issue or some of these issues or we're close to it. There are people here who feel pretty badly. Maybe your head doesn't hurt, but maybe your heart hurts. There's something that's going on a lot of times. I know that there have been many times in my life when I've had to fight certain things. And I want to say this, that, that and to go personal, just for a second here, that what I just read, these things that I just read, whether it's addictions or certain things in my life, this is my story. My story. I grew up without a dad. I grew up with a very worrisome, anxious mother. I was a latchkey kid. Uh, had all kinds of multiple addictions in my life. Multiple addictions. High school teachers would buy me all of the alcohol that I wanted. And so this was my story. Depression was real. Anxiety was real. I was a chain smoker. Had anger issues. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, after Jesus came into my life, things began to change instantly. I've never smoked one more cigarette since my salvation. Not one. Now, last night at the airline situation, I wanted to go have a cigarette and a beer, but I chose not to. And I was just kidding about that. I'm not even tempted, except sometimes. But anyway. My mother, my brother, my sister all came to Jesus. But then there was this issue with my father who I had not seen for 10 years straight until two or three years into be a, being a follower of Jesus. And this is why the Word of God is so real. I heard, and so important, I heard someone say in Malachi 4, 6 that God's going to restore the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the father. I heard that and I thought, I don't even, I don't even really have a father. I've got a biological dad. I'm here on planet. I remember him when I was a child, but I hadn't seen him for 10 years. We might have had one phone conversation a year, not even. And I get this impression that I need to jumpstart something of reconciliation with him. See, a lot of times the victim really needs to rise up and say, I'm not a victim, I'm a victor, and I'm going to go change what was attempting to make me a victim. And so I went out and visited my father. We got reconciled. I wept for three days. I came home, and it's like all this junk was coming out, junk was coming down. A year later, two years later, actually, he calls me up, and he says, can I come to see you? I said, sure. Tell me why. He said, I can't stop thinking about you. He came out to see me. My father visited with me in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, 
And when he visited me, he was touched by everything. And in the, the final day of him being there, he got on his knees and he began to cry for literally two hours. Now I'm sitting there watching this like a movie. Two hours, he's come, tears are coming out of his eyes, his nose, his mouth. And my dad, right before my eyes, get, he gets up off his knees. He raises shaky hands. He's in his uh, he's in his mid-40s at this time. He's raising his shaking hands, and all of a sudden then, a, the Spirit of God comes on him with no teaching, no instruction, no Bible reading, all that. He gets filled with the Holy Spirit. He begins to speak in tongues, and then we get in my car because he's, 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 got, he's got to start to pack up because the next morning he's flying out. He says, is there anything left for me to do? And I said, you need to be water baptized. And he says, great, where do we do that? And I explained it to him. I said, you're going to get baptized in my bathtub in my little bitty apartment. And sure enough, my father, my sinful, hurting, abusive father, I would got the privilege of dunking him in water. And I was holding him down. And he came out a new creation. He was living in California. He moved out and he said, son, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. He sat on the second row of my church for 25 years until he went home to be with Jesus. And he sat behind me and he put his hand on me every Sunday morning before I got up to preach. And he said, you are my son in whom I am well pleased. This is, college students, this is what you have to look forward to. You're going to have a great, great run. You're going to have a great ride. Here's what I learned. I learned in making disciples. That's the first point of this is making disciples takes faith. I learned that my faith is not intended to be passive. Like I'm a follower of the faith. There is something that we must do to own our faith. And for me, it was talking to myself in a mirror in the shower room of our dorm, the men's shower room. And I would look in the mirror before anyone was there in the morning. And I would look myself eye to eye and tell myself who I am through Jesus Christ. That changed my life. Psychologists would possibly call it either neuroplasticity or epigenetics or whatever they want to call it. But this, the Bible, the Word of God has power to transform us. Look at Romans 12, 2. It says, this is the New Living Translation, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. We have to learn to push back our pain. My daughter, Isabella, she's a, she's a cutie. I've got these little twin girls. and They weren't in the playbook. <laughs> they weren't predicted. But my wife wrote in her journal that we're going to have twin girls one day. Couldn't do it naturally, and we got a phone call. Will you adopt these twin girls? Uh, we had nine days to decide. I said, it's in your book, honey. And she, when she wrote it in there, I said, is this what menopause is all about, babe? Because we're not like the normal people, just like spry young people building their family. I have grandkids at that phase, and we do now. We have a beautiful family. Thank God for my whole family. But my nine-year-old woke me up the other night and she said, I had a bad dream. It was 3.30 in the morning. Really bad dream. And she's had a little bit of a habit of these. This is a couple, two, three weeks ago. Occasionally this happens. And I said, honey, you know when you got those mouth sores, you would get these mouth sores and we taught you how to gargle every night and two and three times a day, you use salt water and mouthwash and all that and you got better, right? She said, yes, daddy. I said, why did you get better? She said, because I pushed back. And I said, well, let's talk about fear. How are we going to push back on fear? She said, well, fear is false evidence appearing real. 
I said, you got it. She began to talk her way out of the phobia of the night. And then she said, you know, you know, dad, the other day I, I heard about the big tomatoes talking to the little tomato. You know what he said? I said, no. He said, the big tomato said to the little tomato, catch up. <laughs> then, then she said, then she said this was even better. This is an honor of Dr. Gabe Bouts, PhD in math. She said, what did the math book say to the math book? I said, what? She said, I've got problems. <laughs> and we talked about problems. Why do I bring this up? I bring this up because this boy died to the Shunammite's mother's arms. He died there. And when we are trying to make disciples, it will require that we engage with all the faith that we have because many, if not most, of the students in this generation don't even know, recognize, or realize they've got a headache. And God wants to heal our headaches and our head pains. And that's what we see in so much of culture today. We see pain, we see headaches, and there is something that we can do. Number two is we can make a difference by discipling people into relationship. Relationship is what we must do. And what you see next in this story is you see a, a, the woman traveling to Elisha to say, my son has died. And she was debating with her husband. She said to the husband, I need a donkey. I need help. I need to go see the man of God. And he said that the, the, the husband, the father, the son, the husband, and the husband of the wife said, said, why do you need a donkey? She said, because I need to see the man of God. He said, is everything okay? And here's what she said that is so disciplined, so important. She said these words. She said, all is well. When is the last time that you wanted to curse the darkness because of some pain or agony. But when we're there, we must take that pain to the right place. And she took that pain away from her husband. Her husband did not even know that his son was dead. She kept it in, went to the man of God, poured out her heart. You see, there is no conflict between tears and faith. They go together. You need an emotional catharsis, but that emotional catharsis must go to Jesus if you want results that last. And that's what happened. And so she went on, and then Elisha did what probably he has done before. He sent his staff. He goes and he says, Gehazi, I want you to take this staff, lay it on the boy, and this will raise him up. But you know what happened? It didn't work. This reminded me so much of me that so many times I want to say to a young disciple, say, will you read this book? Will you watch this podcast? Will you go to this event? Go to Maverick City. All those stuff, all that is good. But until, and I've seen so much in my lifetime, so has every pastor and leader up here. We've seen people we would have never guessed would have ever fallen away or do things that are really bad. And what I want to say here is that the breakthrough for that boy never came until the relational impact came. And look what happened here. C.S. Lewis said it like this, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So we take that pain, we own that pain, we work through that pain, and then we get relationally involved with other people. Elisha then, in the passage, he goes on, and because we're Running short on time now, I'll just tell you what happened. You already know the story. Most of you do. You know the story. Elisha did something that was crazy. He walked into the room where the boy was, 
and he spread out his hands on the little boy's hands, put his mouth on his mouth, put his body on his body. By the way, don't try this at home, okay? This is, this is one of these ancient CPR moments. It's a God breathing into Adam to bring life to him. And it says three things. Number one, the boy got warm. Have you ever been working with somebody and you begin to realize, you know, because see, all of us are dead in our trespasses until Christ raises us up. Every one of us, we're dead. We're dead. The only people who can help dead people are living people. And when that life hits that death, there is a possibility that the dead one can come live again. And when you see the image of that boy, the first thing is his body's warm. The second thing, it says that he sneezed seven times. Seven is the number of perfection. Those sneezes came out at 240 miles per hour. And when you're working with people, when the gospel, Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto the salvation of sinful people. And when that gospel gets in there and the Holy Spirit gets in people, it brings something out of them. It brings pathogens out. It brings ugliness. Germs come out. Those sneezes are going everywhere. I was on a fight last night. Sneezes, 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 sneezes. And I wanted to say, come out of them. Come out of them. Come out of them. Every one of them. And then finally it says the boy's eyes were open. And then he went out and he hugged mama. And his mother just went and just hugged the, the prophet, the man of God. Brothers and sisters, when you feel that pain, when you're in agony, when you feel defeated, when you know that there's addictions in your life and things like that, maybe that's already been taken care of, but I already sense that there are some of you right now that you know you need to find water to be baptized. You know you need to do that. It was not enough that somebody, your good parents, took you to the trough and somebody anointed you with water and I have no problem with that. That's tradition for some people, but you need to decide today. You need to have your own sneezes coming out where that stuff gets out of you and something new comes into you. And the more of Jesus we have, the more life we have. The more of Jesus we have, there is the abundance of joy, the abundant life that he promises us. God wants to give you a good life. I've had so many trials following Jesus that I'm sure that many of the trials are because I'm following Jesus, but I have zero regrets because Jesus plus a trial means that Jesus has already conquered the world and conquered the trials and conquered the disease and conquered the dysfunction and conquered the dissonance and conquered the things that have separated us from the love of God. This mantling took place and this boy was changed. So today I ask this simple question. Discipleship, by the way, is a supernatural, supernatural thing. Our faith and confidence is not in ourselves that we know the Bible. Our faith and confidence is in the Holy Spirit who's at work in these people's lives. When I met a hockey player named Adam Burt, he came to me, he said, I want more relationship. He was playing for the Carolina Hurricanes and we met and it was so crazy how God spoke to me that you'll be a part of this team. And, I was just, and it was through this man. And he came to me one day, I'll never forget. He said, I need more time with you. I said, what do you want? I said, do you, are you looking for passive mentoring? He said, no, no, no. I said, do you want active mentoring where I just, we just read a book together? He said, no, no, no. I said, oh, I think you're looking for discipleship in your life. He said, what's that? I said, following Jesus, being transformed by Jesus and getting on the mission with Jesus. And that's exactly what happened to him. I said, you know, I'm going to be in your life. I'm going to ask you about your thoughts. I'm going to ask you about your, your family. I'm going to ask you about your marriage. I'm going to talk to you about everything. I said, that's what I want. That man went out and he started three churches and he's the chaplain of the New York Jets. <clears throat> Making disciples is the work of God. But right now, we want to go into a moment of prayer. Because God wants to launch something. My first question for you, my first question is, are you ready to start a gospel movement? Are you ready to make disciples? Even if you're not ready, that's okay. You don't have to be ready. You have to be willing and available.
That's it. You say, I don't know that much. I don't either. I don't really want to do that. I don't either. I'm praying about it. Yeah, I know what that is. I prayed with the a girl in my hall when I was a junior, and she said, hey, when are you going to start that Bible study? You told me about the Bible study. I said, any day now. Three months later, when are you going to do this Bible study? I said, any day now. She said, no, you're not. And she put her, her left hand on her hip. I can't forget it. Her right hand, she's like, I've been telling you, you're going to start this. It's going to start in my dorm room. We're going to start out of there, and we're going to start this week. She totally gave it to me. She blasted me. I walked into her dorm room, had every poster, I am poster, I am God poster, I am Jesus poster. I said, we don't even need a Bible in this room. Let's start right here. (laughs) And that grew out of her room into the lobby room, into the basement. God was moving on our campus. You know, I want to activate your faith right now. I want some of you to say, yes, stand up if you want to be a disciple maker. Stand up if you want to start making disciples. Stand up. Say yes to the Lord. Just say yes, Lord. This is going to be a launching. A launching. A launching. And I know that there's probably peer pressure, like everybody stand up. Okay, I'm going to stand up. That's, that's, that's cool too. And because a lot of times God uses us when we're del- so weak. So weak. Pastor Donnell, please just join me. But I want you to take a step of faith and just say, You know the guy down the hall? You know the guy in the hotel? You know the guy in the classroom? You know that person, that girl? You know that girl? It's extraordinary that that so many people are way more ready than we have any idea. I had one guy had a bong in his room, and he had a bong, and this is going way back, but he had this big bong, and he was so fearsome and scary. He was the drug dealer of the dorm, and one day I preached to him, I got, just, I got fear, it came fierce on me one day. I just need to go talk to him. And I did. I just, and I dumped it out. I wasn't even very nice or skilled or anything, but I put it out there. And he said, I've been waiting for you to talk to me. And he was choked up. Became a deacon in a church. <laughs> That's your life. <clears throat> That's your assignment. <clears throat> Let's start a gospel movement. Let's meet three years from now and there's 10,000 of us here. Let's start a gospel movement. 